Have you ever played Monopoly before? You know the board game where you roll the dice, buy up properties, try to take everyone else's money until you're the richest and everyone else is so poor that they have to give up and then you get to win with all of the money in real estate? Now picture starting a game of Monopoly and realizing that someone else that you're playing with has been given twice as much money to start off with. Because of this beneficial starting point, they end up winning the game. And then afterwards, they say that the reason they won the game is because they had a better strategy and just played the game the best. You'd probably be thinking to yourself, what the hell are you talking about? You literally started off with twice as much money. Isn't it obvious that at least part of the reason why they won is because of this financial head start, even if they did also have a good strategy? This is a pretty straight up reflection of the system we live in. We operate as if it's hard work, strategy, and good decisions that make someone successful, and we don't give as much thought to where someone started out from. This is the land of opportunity, right? Anyone has the ability to grab onto an opportunity, and as long as they have some natural intelligence, they can work hard and make it. I have the best advice for women in business. Get your fucking ass up and work. This way of thinking involves an underlying belief that we are indeed in a meritocracy. And I personally feel like there's a huge connection between a meritocracy and class mobility. But first of all, let's explain what a meritocracy is so that we're all on the same page here. A meritocracy is a social system where our advancement in society is based on our individual capability, so our merit, and not on your family status, class, wealth, or social capital. It's basically very individual, right? Like, we generally don't act like it's a good thing to have inherited wealth or been given money in a place in society. Instead, it's looked upon more favorably if what you have comes from your own individual effort, so your self-reliance and your ability to work hard and achieve for yourself. It's kind of like when we look at the ultra-wealthy. We love to say that they did it on their own, highlighting the ones that are self -made made, and criticizing anyone who brings up the privilege or the family wealth that contributed to it, kind of like the Monopoly game. What this obsession with merit and doing the work on your own has led to is us all collectively agreeing that we live in a place where you can easily change your life from the circumstances you were born into with hard work and intelligence. Basically that it all rests on your shoulders and hard work alone to move from one class to another, whether it be from the lower class to the middle class or from the middle class to the upper class. When meritocracy was first used and accepted in our society, it was first positioned as a way to increase social mobility. It gave people with less privileges and no potential for nepotism a possibility of actually joining the people who were already up there at the top. In reality, it turned into this convenient facade. People think meritocracy equals more equality and class mobility, but in reality, that's simply not the case. In simple terms, class mobility means being able to leave your current class and ideally move upwards into a better class. And we talked before about how the middle class specifically has seen some mobility in the last 50 or so years, but it hasn't all been upwards. Now we're going to look at US data for a second here, but then we're going to compare it to Canada and other countries for context. So this chart that we've looked at before shows how people are leaving the middle class and going both up towards the upper class and also down to the lower class. So class mobility, sure. It's just not all upwards like it's implied. When it comes to the middle class, only actually about 20% of people from the true middle class ever make it to the top one. And there's more where that came from. If we look at the lower class, about 70% of people from the bottom one-fifth of the income distribution never make it to the middle class, and only about 10% of that group make it all the way to the top. Actually, 40% of those people are just as poor as adults as they were when they were kids. Now, if you're hearing that and you're feeling like, well, it's still some mobility, sure it is, but you and I both know that that's not the level of class mobility that people are talking about when they say that anyone can make it. It shows some movement, but at very, very low levels. Now, because of all this, there's actually a growing trend that people's ability to gain wealth is actually directly tied to their parents. For the most part, the family that you were born into and the circumstances that you had at birth do directly dictate where you'll be later in life. Now, we're obviously talking about the majority here, and there's of course some exceptions to the rule. Here's a visual for this that I found really interesting. It explains you climbing the class mobility ladder with a rubber band around your ankle tying you to your parents. If your parents are further up on the ladder, then naturally the rubber band pulls you up with them. But if they're lower down, then the rubber band's constantly dragging you down as you try to climb further up. Now, potentially the rubber band could break free, but it just depends on how strong it is. And there's actually a term for how strong the rubber band is. It's called intergenerational earnings elasticity, which basically measures how much of a kid's movement away from the average income can be accounted for by their parents' income. Here's how some different countries score based on this system. Now, it's actually called The Great Gatsby Curve, which was obviously a really great movie, but it's actually named named off of the original book. Now, if you look at the horizontal axis, that measures income inequality. And the further to the right you are, the more that the wealth in your country is concentrated among a really small group of people. Now, the vertical axis is that intergenerational earnings elasticity measurement. And the further up it you are, the closer the relationship between a parent's income and their kid's future income. You can see that the US is all the way up at the very top, which means that there's a lot of income inequality, and there's also a really tight relationship between your parent's income and yours. Now, in Canada, it's a little less extreme, but the correlation still exists. 
So why has this happened? Why is class mobility not as possible as we feel like it is or should be? One explanation is that the actual steps of the hypothetical ladder that we keep talking about have grown further and further apart. We read that people in the top 20% of income distribution have nine times more wealth than the people in the bottom 20%. Basically, the rich are getting richer and everyone else just isn't. There's a few ways to measure this, but one is just looking at actual incomes. This chart shows that between 1970 and 2020, lower class incomes rose by 45%, middle class incomes rose by 50%, and upper class incomes rose by almost 70%. So people who were already richer became even more so and just pulled away. You can also see here that the upper class is gaining a greater share of total income, whereas the middle class is losing it and the lower class has pretty much stayed the same. Basically, because the rich are getting richer, it just makes it a lot harder for you to earn as much money as you have to in order to actually jump classes. And all of this is actually pretty new. There used to be more class mobility and just a higher likelihood of you earning as much or even more money than your parents did. But this chart shows a trend that's been creeping up on. On us. Basically every decade, the likelihood of you earning more than your parents drops. People born in the 1940s had the best odds with almost 90% of kids earning more than their parents, but compare that to the 1980s, it's almost half as likely. And if we look at today's data for millennials and Gen Zs, the odds have dropped to below 50% for the first time ever. This means that 50% will have worse or the same conditions as their parents. This we probably hear more of, right? It's hard to buy a house now, student loan debts are rising. And listen, there's a lot of factors that contribute to it being harder to earn more than your parents, but we don't always make the connection that that means that class mobility is harder too. Instead, we act like the American dream or even the Canadian dream to a lesser extent is still well and alive. And maybe it used to be, right? Especially for some people, but it's literally becoming less and less likely and harder and harder to capitalize on. So why is that? Why don't we wanna talk about the fact that class mobility isn't as much of a for sure thing anymore? First, let's take a quick look at the Canadian data here, which is definitely interesting to look at because class mobility isn't quite as bad as it is in the US. Now, I found this one article where it talks about social mobility in Canada as if it's still looking amazing. The author literally says something like, um, we need to teach the young people that there's hope instead of doom and gloom. But when I looked at the real stats, that's not the whole story. Stats Canada said that they see a similar trend to what's happening in the US, which is that there's less income mobility across generations. Now, Canada's middle class did see the most movement, but 20% of the middle class actually moved to the bottom 20% and only 17% of the middle class moved to a higher class. So yes, in Canada, we do have less of a tie between our parents' income and our income and our ability to move classes is higher, but it doesn't mean that we're for sure moving up. Okay, so let's get into talking about why we overestimate how much class mobility there is, or specifically why we think there's a strong possibility that you can move upwards off of just hard work alone. One factor is definitely a lack of information about all of this. Obviously, all these different statistics that we just talked about, right? It's not like they're widely available to a lot of people. The average person's just living their day-to-day -day life and going off of what they hear. And what they've been hearing is that we're in a meritocracy, that if you just work hard, then you can make it, and if you don't, then it's on you. Another reason that I've personally hypothesized is because we don't want to hear it. I get that all these things we've talked about sound kind of negative, right? And who wants to feel worse about their life and their possibility for success? Instead, we want to feel hopeful and we want the data to kind of back that up too. It just makes the capitalist system that we live in easier to bear and it gives it a purpose that could actually work for us. And I get all of that, but our belief is that it doesn't actually make things better just to believe that they're better. It's kind of like slapping a band-aid on it. You actually have to know all of the uncomfortable truths to really understand how the systems work and then how you can succeed within them. Otherwise, you could just be blind Finally working towards something, something, something that would never happen because it can't. Like we talked about in our video about capitalism, by design, most people in a capitalistic society are within the working class, so the middle and the lower classes. But instead of public interest and policy actually raising the standard of living for those people that are always going to be there, instead we focus on raising the chances of being rich and therefore being one of the lucky ones. Key word being luck. Realistically, nothing is going to change right now when people don't even want to talk about what's going on with class mobility. But let's say that all of us that in people do start realizing and talking about the fact that class mobility has dropped or at least upwards mobility has, then what? I think that people need to think about their real best interests. And instead of having a society that operates based on ideals and best case scenarios, we should focus on raising the standard of living for all the people who are gonna have to remain in the lower classes. Now that doesn't mean that people shouldn't still work hard and try and change their circumstances. We definitely believe in hard work and trying to do what you can to make the best of your situation. But we also know that the full equation looks more like hard work, plus natural abilities, plus the circumstances that you start from, plus a little bit of luck. You need all of those different pieces factored in. 
We want our message to be clear. We believe in working hard, making money, and changing your life. But we also believe in looking at the truth of our system and not sugarcoating it. Either way, we wanna hear your stories and your thoughts on class mobility down in the comment box below. And while you're at it, make sure you like and subscribe, of course. And if you haven't checked out any of our previous videos, we did one on capitalism and one on whether student loan debt should be forgiven. So yeah, if you haven't checked those out, make sure you check those out next door, door. We will be back, you know the vibes, let's go.